It's got everything. Yeah. And so it's got everything. It's a wonderful song. Yeah. Like it would be one of those songs. It's like you'd be proud to tote this around and be like, yeah, yeah, hip hop made this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. So he's, he's including all of us now. Um, and I hope right. someday you'll join us in the world will live as one. Like that's a sentiment that transcends the time and space. You know, <clears throat> what's crazy is that, you know, you know, when I say on a court in a hip hop, quote unquote, that I don't listen to this happy stuff. Mm hmm get by would probably qualify as one of those records because when you were telling me that there were Beatles references mm -hmm. many and, of them and many of them I was like well hell I'm the wrong person to ask because I haven't listened to the record in so long and not because I have any issues with telling it because I don't and not like on some sort of like personal vendetta to it it's like right. literally I haven't heard the record in a while and this is what I mean, and let me qualify and explain myself a little further, too. When I say <clears throat> I don't like the happy records, it's not that I don't like them. It's just they're not the records that I tend to go back and listen to, which is why I had to go get reacquainted with this record, even though I'm rather familiar with it from the time it was released. Right. Like, it's rare that, like, there, it's rare that, like, an uplifting record really makes me go back to it again and again. Like, mm -hmm. um, like DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince Summer, right. or uh, Fight the Power of Republican. <laughs> you know, like those types of songs, they're usually all time great when I love them. And I do think that this song is all time great. It's just not in the pocket of what I listen to. So I had to go familiarize myself, you know? Mm -hmm. like, like I wake up and like this is what I mean about my hip hop mind, Andrew. I wake up and I want to hear "Living in the World Today" by the Jizz off Liquid Swords. <clears throat> you know, where the like he's saying stuff on there like I be swinging towards strictly bass on keyboards, unbalanced like elephants and ants on seesaws. I I throw raps that attack like the Japs at Pearl Harbor. MCs be out like bank robbers fleeing the scene to be a soul survivor. That's the type of stuff I like. To hear. Okay. So darker. So, yeah, something a little darker, something a little bit more intricate. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's just typically where my, where my, where my, where my hip hop nuance uh, navigates me mm -hmm. and, and gravitates towards. Not that I don't appreciate the full spectrum of that. So, yeah. that's just a little bit to give you some context about how I view a record like this. But it's the biggest record of his career, and mm -hmm. it's clear to hear why when you hear it. it it's arguably his most complete song. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Because it has, um, how about this? Get by as a very equimini, mm -hmm. full type of feeling, where yeah. it's like no, they covered everything that you can cover in a rap song in terms mm -hmm. of like musicality, instrumentation, uh, hook, bridge, cadence, flow, content, subject matter, intro, outro, breakdown, yep. full full song. It's got everything. Yeah. So it's got everything. It's a wonderful song. Yeah. Like, it would be one of those songs that's like, you'd be proud to tote this around and be like, yeah, yeah, hip-hop made this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So definitely that. So I want to kind of, like, clear all of those things, too. Yeah. It's very important, yeah. That we don't have personal beef with Talib Kweli. Like, this is this is, this is a great song. It's one of my favorites. Like, it's... Yeah. Um, I just want to contextualize everything. You know what I mean? Because we have to be objective about this, obviously, because yeah. of some, some uh, you know, I mean, like he's posted on the court in the hip hop quite a few times. You know, we've often come on the show a few times and I'm not going to spend too much time getting into all that. I just want to clarify that we are coming from an objective place for discussing yeah. this record because it's great. And the beat's done by Kanye and memory serves too. So it goes back to uh, a day when things were a little bit more simpler and not as uh, a yeah. contention. Yeah. When, when Kanye was known for his music more than his let's say social commentary yeah you can say thing about to live at this point too that's what i mean about it being a simpler time <clears throat> yeah it's like i know this is a hip-hop song i always have felt like this is almost a gospel song like it's got that feel to me um it's that kind of uplifting and the and the lyric is and the lyric is not like super 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 uplifting i mean i mean it talks about some 
not dark stuff, but like complicated things. <laughs> but like the feel of it is just um, is, is is almost like gospel song to me. I think <clears throat> that's that that's where I was like saying, and I feel like it's it's a Clementine in that in mm-hmm. that in, in that respect is that well, it has a soulful and a churchy mm-hmm. yeah to it that your typical rap record doesn't have like when the uh, when, when the when the bridge thinking about my highs and my lows, you know, it's like yeah, your typical rap mm-hmm. record doesn't like give you like that. Type like soul and that type of like gospel type of feel. Goody Mob and Outcast are yep. more known in that popular in hip hop culture in terms of executing the song in a high threshold. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it has those elements. That's what I mean. It's not really missing anything. <clears throat> it's a pretty yeah. perfect record. Yeah. Yeah. And um I like um this is what I like to call real rap too. Okay. Um, I Tell think, me about that. I think, too often, I think too often, real rap gets misconstrued as um, the stereotypes that typify and personify, oftentimes, especially the black man in mm-hmm. hip hop culture, not just pop music, which is the um, the hustler, um, the playboy, mm-hmm. the thug, the criminal, right. Um, and what this um and this is what i mean about this is real real rap well talib is really having a um a very intelligent discourse on the nuances of the tenuous nature of being brought up in a um inner city environment right with circumstances and natures too too often in hip-hop you know it's funny it's like man it's funny how all these guys were the biggest guy on their block you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. They came from the blocks, but everybody was the biggest guy on the block. Yeah. And, you know, everybody, you know, moved kilos and everybody did a jail deal and everybody shot a couple people and everybody's done this, that, or the other. This yeah. is this is more rooted in, in some of these guys, you know, have been and done some of those things in various points. You know, and just real quick, what you'll find, and I tell people this all the time, I'm like, don't confuse like a hustler for a gangster all the time. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes the same person exists within, mm-hmm. sometimes the two things exist within one person. <clears throat> but I know people who are hustlers who aren't gangsters. I know gangsters who aren't hustlers. You know what I'm right. saying? I know players who aren't pimps, you know? Mm-hmm. I know pimps who aren't players. <laughs> yeah. You know? It contain multitudes and we can't reduce people to their, their stereotypes. Right. Right. Which is part of the point of the show, right? And that's correct. Well, hip hop music sometimes by our own uh, self inflicted wounds that is kind of capitulated by the music industry. We uh we only share these sentiments, and so this is a record that has all the full reality sentiments. You know, mm-hmm. struggles about real drug abuse, about not having enough money to pay the bills, about you his know? grandmother raising four three daughters, four like yeah. Like, I mean, oh, those kind of things, sure. Not that those don't happen in other communities too, but I mean, right. they do, for sure. Well, that, that that's well, that's why I'm saying inner city. Notice I didn't say black or Latino, right. because it's really more of like <clears throat> the older I get, the more uh, Marvin Gaye's inner city blues just kind of. I love that's one of my very. Fa- We've talked about that on the show before. I think that's one of my favorite songs in the history of the world. Correct. It's one of my. It's probably one of my ten favorite songs ever too. Yeah. So like, bear with you on that. But it just rings so true because <clears throat> it applies to a certain demographic, but it doesn't apply to a couple. Right. Yeah. You know? And I think that is where somebody like me who typically doesn't listen to this style of rap consistently, mm-hmm. and somebody like you who considers yourself more of an outsider voyaging into hip hop. Mm-hmm. I think this is a song where we meet. Yeah. Because it's exactly. all the things. And it's talking about issues that you and I can both relate to. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people who aren't from, you know, <clears throat> like when I say I'm a Pusha T fan, it's like, well, a lot of people aren't like, you know what I mean, from an impoverished environment or from the streets and haven't been around street guys. So it's like a lot of the rhetoric that he espouses. I can understand why if you don't gravitate towards mm-hmm. it, out outside of um 
his, his literary mechanisms and devices are supreme. Yeah, they are. But, I, I, but, but yeah, they are. They're supreme. But if you, you don't gravitate to those other things, well, I understand why if you're not from, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's not your this world. Re- yeah. Not your world. This record is more everybody's world. And it's more mm-hmm. everybody's world executed very, very well. Yeah. I mean, everybody, regardless of where you come from, knows that this morning I woke up feeling brand new. Like, you know that feeling or hope for that feeling anyway. Um, and like, I'm waking up and want to, it's, it's a modern, a change is going to come. It's that kind of, kind of same sentiment um, in, yeah. in the, in the song that, um, when that, it, that it, you want, you, you're yeah. seeing the struggles in your life and because every, everybody has struggles in their life, regardless of where you're from. Um, and you are trying to transcend those or, wake up and make a new start and it's and it's uplifting in that way right it is when he says you know you know to stop smoking and stop drinking and lately i've been thinking about my reasons Mm -hmm. just get by you know Mm -hmm. it's like you cannot relate to that yeah (laughs) like, you know, just the part where it says that I've been thinking about my reasons just to get by. Mm-hmm. That's like that's like a mouthful said very, very well. That's what I mean. It's like, well, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot in the song. Yeah. Yeah, it's exceptional. So um I actually want to do to spend some time like kind of like um dissecting uh the Beatles uh you know uh portions of this song that are mentioned. Uh, because we are kind of like you know we're putting it with John Lennon's Imagine, mm-hmm. which I is mean, one of the, which is one of those songs that once again was indoctrinated in my mind before I was even really familiar with who right. he was. Probably wasn't familiar. I didn't even hear the Beatles till I was fifteen, sixteen. Probably wasn't familiar with them till I was twenty. But I knew the song from the time I was about five. Yeah, this is. Um, we'll, we'll come back around to this in a minute, but I think this is the most important song made by a Beatle post the band breaking up. Um, it's certainly the most iconic um i I think it's one of the most iconic songs in american musical history honestly i mean it's a super 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 important song um but i mean the original idea for pairing these two together um get by and imagine was that while he um name drops this song in get by at the end of the second verse and then I went back. I mean, the songs actually do match um, thematically too, um, yeah, not just that. in in that. But um, Talib Kweli obviously name drops a song on purpose because they match thematically. Um, his is more like this is what life is like right now, um, and imagine, of course, is about what we wish life could be. Um, but I guess they both kind of are hinting at that as well um there's the, 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 there's there's the what could be of both songs where yeah. the songs yeah yeah um and one's talk i guess one's talking about like their personal journey right like the this is what i need to be able to do to transcend the situation and one's more of a wide angle lens for the um for society or whatever but um so the one that I wanted to talk about first is um, that's not as explicit is the um, where he talks about the G rap shit living to let die. That's an album, right? Right. I'm glad that you caught that. Yeah. <clears throat> this is what I mean about the reality of the song mm-hmm. is, is that, well, it's not a quote unquote street record. Mm hmm. But he just name dropped like the best street MC probably that ever come out of New York, Gucci yeah. Rap, and his one of his better projects, mm-hmm. "Wanted Dead or Alive" is probably his best project. A little rich, but to live in, yeah, like so. It lets you. It's a couple things. It's Quali letting you know, like, hey, this is an uplifting song. Shit is still real out here. Right, so bringing up Gucci Rap, but it's mm-hmm. also him. You know, well, I do quote unquote by the media's portrayal conscious music, but I'm still a rap guy because I know my cool G rap 
and I'm still you got from both. Brooklyn. Yeah, it's a bed thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I'm still from Brooklyn. Name drops before that. Right. And I'm still from Brooklyn, so I know my street stuff. So I know my cool G rap. You know what I mean? That's what mm-hmm. I mean when I'm saying the records really not missing everything. It covers everything. Yeah. The the yeah. point that I was making to go with that though is that I, I'm sure you know this, but um, "Live and Let Die" is a Paul McCartney song originally. Um, it is. It goes back to like the early '70s. It's one of his. Uh, he they asked Paul McCartney to write the theme song for um, a James Bond movie, um, which above the same name, "Live and Let Die," and so he's so so the the genius of Quali's line right there is that he's both referencing Cool G Rap and that album, um, but both of those trace back to one of the the biggest songs one of the other actual biggest songs um post beatles breakup that one of them wrote too um guns and roses did a cover of it in the early 90s too but the mccartney version is you know, early mid 70s um so so the live and i mean obviously live and let die that um that idea um is threaded through these songs too um to but but i want to make sure we we caught that reference as well because it's a reference both to cool g rap which he says explicitly but also back to um paul mccartney too um which is one of those beatles things they're everywhere like beatles are just like that's what i mean it's like well they're part of you know everybody's culture if you were born like after 1975 pretty much Mm mm-hmm some sort of shape form of things. Yeah. And then of course there's the references at the end of the second verse. Um he references let me pull up the lyrics. He references the John Lennon, the Imagine explicitly. Um let me look. He says I was I wasn't even aware of the whole I never put the whole to live and let die mm-hmm. thing together. Like I thought that was James Bond. That's why when Coogee Rap did it, I was like, oh, Coogee Rap took James Bond thing. He did. He did. <laughs> but, the, the, but the theme song for it is Paul McCartney's song. See, I didn't, I, I, I didn't found that out today. Yeah. Just now. That's cool. Yeah. It's, and you should, it's a great song, too. Um, I need to pay more attention. You know, I, you know, James Bond is like one of my favorite, like. Mm-mm. I did not like, know that. Yeah, I'm a big James Bond fan. Hmm. I'm, I'm learning big. things today, too. Yeah. That's what this show is for. Yeah, Maybe exactly. exactly. One of your friends loves James Bond, but yeah. I've always <laughs> so this is a joke I tell my my black friends, Andrew. I'm like, yeah, it's Brady and James Bond are my two favorite white people. They're like, one of them isn't real, am I? Like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a fictional character. It's okay. He's still a bad man. <laughs> I was like, I was like, don't some white people like Shaft? I was like, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. yeah, the lyric is our parents sing like John Lennon. Imagine all the people watch, um, from Get By, and I mean there, there's so there's that reference. I mean because the whole song Imagine is framed around Imagine. There's blah blah blah, right? I mean it's there has three verses that that are set up like that. He's sort of adding another one, um, and he is also. I think it, w- it was really cool is that he's connecting the cultures there to not just by name dropping, but he's saying our parents, um, our parents sing like John Lennon, right? So he is saying their his parents, our parents, um, in that community are familiar with John Lennon and are singing like this too, right? It's not just white society, I guess. He, he's he's I, pulling. I, I took the that as him connecting. Uh, the protest music side of both genres together. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like when he's comparing John Lennon, yeah, he's like, no, no, no. Like that's protest music too. It's just not mm-hmm. quote unquote our type of protest music. Yeah. Correct. But still doing the okay. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. same, same, um, same thing. Like you were stating earlier, thematically the same once again. Mm-hmm. And then the last lines we rock like Paul McCartney from now until the last Beatle dropped. Like, I mean, obviously it's a pun on the last beat dropping. Um, but, but that's where the Beatles' name comes from, is from the beat, too, right? I mean, the backbeat beat. Um, and, I didn't know that. I found that out today, too. Yeah. They they were... W- one of the things that they wanted... 
like an idea for their name was the Beatles. Like they're playing off of um Buddy Holly. You guys know you know Buddy Holly? Okay. <laughs> Buddy Holly's band was called the Crickets. Um, so they were playing off of that. Um and but they then they changed it to spell like the beat like the drum beat beat instead of the uh, the animal oh, or insect. Oh, that's dope and you see you know uh, greatness inspiring greatness mm -hmm. as well <clears throat> we're gonna have to do something about buddy holly too because he was an interesting bird man like and he was he was in the he was alongside i mean the beatles are the generation after like elvis little richard etc um the buddy holly though was one of the first ones he was he was in that generation too with little richard and and them so and he also died in a plane crash um these people on these planes so Crazy. Um, I, I just wanted to point out there are lots of beatles references and that's one of the ways the songs are tied together that talib is like pulling references and i'm sure he's doing it on purpose pulling references from those songs to um to connect the two even though he d was not doing it for the purposes of the show but but there are lots of connections between the two intentionally so i think oh yeah i'm sure they are. this is what i mean about part of what makes this record great too is that when you hear it, the intention i think is to reach all the way to your spectrum mm -hmm. yeah and hip-hop used to be in a place where that was a, a dangerous thing you know, you were going in the camera video. You were doing stuff like that, you know? And so part mm -hmm. of hip-hop's evolution has been bringing more real hip-hop to the masses. Right. This expression of that evolution as well. It's like, well, this is a crossover hit, but mm -hmm. not in the way it touch this is. Not in the way, I'm sorry, it cut it out. In the way, what is? You can't touch this. Oh, you can't touch this, yeah. Too legit to quit. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, not like that. It's not, no. not like that, but still crossover. And that's where hip hop musically has grown. The writers have gotten better, production better. Mm -hmm. Things yeah. have come together too. It's a wonderful record. Um, <clears throat> um, can, um there's one more thing too. Um the that we get high on all types of drug when all you really need is love is also a Beatles reference to to all you need is love um and, and to all uh, to be that was during the beatles heavy drug period too honestly but like he so it's um it's it's also making that reference to all you need is love and it's and it's um it's sort of poking fun at that because you know get by a lot of the song is about the systemic things that are problematic in the inner city communities um and so He's not exactly poking fun at a song that says "All You Need Is Love," but it is it is a little bit poking fun at that. Um, there, 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 there's some small tongue in cheek there, maybe yeah. small, nothing heavy. No, I, think it's, it's not, more, I don't think he's being disrespectful. I think that's more the writer expression, what I yeah. would call it. It's like the knowing you that he's a great writer. Yeah, more than just trying to be disrespectful. Yeah. Yeah. No, the the idea, I, I don't know that this song was meant to be this Beatle droppy, name droppy, or referenced originally. Um, one of the things that Stephen King talks about when you're writing fiction, but it, it applies also to poetry and applies to songwriting too, is he, he talked about when he wrote Carrie, his first novel, um, he realized when he first wrote it, like the first draft, that there were blood images in a couple of the really critical points of the story um so he went back in his revisions and added more of those kinds of references in in his revision and that's kind of what it feels like happened here like he had a couple things in here that were beatles or beatles adjacent and then he realized that that worked pretty well so he went back and added more that'd be i, I like i don't know him i don't that that is my speculation as a writer and as somebody who is interested in the craft of how these things get done, I'm sure, I'm sure there are other Beatles references in here that I'm missing. But like, um, you also, know, so when you're when you're saying all this to me, I'm like, okay, so Kanye and Talib are obviously in the studio, like on a Beatles kick, like yeah. music. That's that's what it sounds like, and it has that kind of 
swelling, uplifting kind of feel that a lot of their songs do too. The all and, you need is love kind of and, and live and, and let die too. Like that oh. is also a uplifting sounding song, even though it's a McCartney and not a Beatles song. But that's what I mean is, is that well, this appears to be intentional. It actually it's harder to do when it's intentional. Mm -hmm. Like usually when it organically happens is when it's fabulous. It's like if this was intentional on top of it, that's actually a harder pull off. It's like, hey, I want to make an uplifting Beatles type of record. Yeah. And that's I not mean, an like, easy thing to do in a hip hop land. Like, and, but but if you think about it, can't you see Kanye saying that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Kanye, Kanye believes he can do it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And Kanye will tell the artist, he's like, "Hey, we we the Beatles now. We can do it. I totally see that." Yeah. 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 Like I I'll, I can't I can't get off of the song either without talking about because the the rhythm and the cadence of imagine is so not simple but very straightforward very this the the syncopated and like the triplet flow um of the second verse and he he does it i mean you usually see that or the times that i'm familiar with artists doing that kind of flow in a song is just like a bar or two to kind of change it up he does it for like eight or ten in a row that's um, more and, it's, it's, and to me that's really difficult to do and to make it pull off and sound good <clears throat> and i love I it think, too <laughs> i think this is more of the talib's rhyme pattern has kind of always been built that way oh, okay and i think this is just you know a lot of the times i think earlier on it's still early in his career but even before this it was a little bit more off kilter mm -hmm. so that's that you're talking about this is around the time that he, he rounded into flow uh, in the form of this flow okay. and, and like i've been recently saying it's like oh the way he sounds right now oh he sounds better than he's ever sounded in my opinion mm -hmm. as in especially his flow and delivery his flow and his delivery is as sick as it's ever been in my opinion yeah I, I just had never heard anybody doing the activism attacking the system of blacks and Latins in prison like that. And he, but he does it. And he goes all the way through. I ain't bullshitting you now. And he comes back out of it. But like, there's a whole like two thirds yeah. of the verse he does that it's, that yeah. way. It's very cool, G rapish. Is it really? Yeah, I mean, like with, with the with the actual verbiage that's being used and mm -hmm. how he's higher and continuing to stack it. Yeah, that's kind of cool, G rapish. You know, like 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 um, G rap kind of punches the mic more. So it's like it's like kind of like the evolution of rhyme. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like people take the things their predecessor have been and just kind of like stack upon it. But there is something G rap ish about the wordplay mm -hmm. and the actual delivery of the wordplay. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. very. It's, it, it has momentum to it. Like it it feels like even though he's not speeding up, it feels like he's it's like speeding up and speeding up and speeding up because the breath control to do that is really difficult too. Um, and he's, he's, he's like accelerates, accelerates, which kind of the style mimics the lyric too, because he's ta what he's talking about is also about feeling like things are a little bit spiraling out of control. So the, those two things work together. Um, it's one of the many reasons the song works. Um, like like you said, the song has everything. It even has the sing along hook, which is why, or hooks plural actually, um, that my ears are attuned to, which is one of the things the Beatles have too. Which is, I think, a good place to to segue. Imagine is a simple and straightforward song, um, based on a simple two chord vamp, one to four, with a little walk up and a da 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 da. In between right and but but it's it was revolutionary in many ways too not because of the lyrical content necessarily um though there is that too but this is also the song or one of the songs that launched john lennon into the i mean he was already you know one of the biggest stars on earth but moved him into the um, more social commentary world um, as opposed to just uh, a kid musician from Liverpool too. And people forget that when the Beatles broke up, he still wasn't even 30 years old. So like they were very young still. Um, and so this is kind of like his second or the beginning of his second act. And this was 
if I'm not if I'm remembering correctly, the first one he released after the Beatles broke up too. It's um, like 71, 72. Yeah, 70 or 71, yeah. It it was it was really funny. I mean, not to get too much into Beatles history as opposed to comparing the two songs, but I know Lennon did and I know George Harrison did um released albums the same year the Beatles broke up. John Lennon was actually, I think Instant Karma um, came out, like the song Instant Karma came out in 1969. Some of them came out like before the Beatles officially broke up um, too. It's, there, there's a lot of crossover in that time, like 69, 70, 71 kind of era. But the song is probably one, I said this I think before in the episode, but just in case, like it's certainly one of the most important songs um, and most iconic songs in modern music history of any genre, of any style, of any whatever. It's one of the one of the very very top of the list songs. First of all, I didn't know that they broke up before they were like thirty. I'm pretty sure that's right. I'm gonna, I'm going to check while you're talking, but um, if if they were more than thirty, they were, it was just barely. Okay. That gives more credence to like Bill Maher's sentiment. Have you ever heard Bill Maher's sentiment? I think I sent you the clip about how he was saying they broke up because Lennon was losing the song battle to McCartney. Like, yeah, you, you've said that. He was born, they were born in 1940. So yeah, he was he was born in October of 1940. So yeah, he was 29 okay. when they broke up. Um, okay. So yeah, that gives more credence to him losing the song thing because that's the ego thing around mm -hmm. that age. Yeah. Your ego's very, very strong around that age. Um, I think what John Lennon really did with this record, in, in my estimation, is he spoke for the people and to the people at once. Mm -hmm. And when an artist of his already very, very high level stardom and stature does something like that, mm -hmm. it does kind of next level the artist and next level the song. I think this is one of those songs that truly is at the right time in the right place and speaking to the right people. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you're saying is, is very good that the song is speaking for himself, like his personal wish for the world, but he's also putting words to what a lot of people are feeling as well. Right. And, and it connects on lots of different levels like that. Well, I've told you like a great artist <clears throat> knows how to bring you into their world mm -hmm. and you enjoy it. But what if your worlds are the same? It takes on a yeah. whole nother life and shape. And yeah. so the stuff that he's saying in this record, well, it's not his world. It's our world. Right. I know a lot of people around that time when you're we like reading this out, just and listening to it, it's like, no, it's speaking to the people for the time. Yeah. Yeah. This these are the um these are the baby boomers who have grown up. Yeah, you know, he's, he's, he's yeah. This is his adult or one of his adult records, right? He's, I mean, because right. people forget that the Beatles were a boy band, like they were one of the original boy bands, right? I mean, they kind of they were just because they were incredibly talented songwriters. Um, they were, yeah. they they were a boy band, and they were, um, girls screaming, kind of in sync, Backstreet Boys, that kind of screaming for them. Like the, yeah. the, the, there's a famous story about them playing. They decided eventually they decided in like 1966, I think to stop playing live anymore because they played at Shea stadium in New York and they couldn't hear each other on the stage because the people were screaming so loud in the stadium. Like, like he couldn't hear the people staying right next to him on the stage. And he's like, I, we, we can't do this anymore, which is when they started doing Sergeant Pepper and all of the high tech studio stuff. That's a sidebar. But the point is that they were a boy band. And so this is his or one of those coming of age records, kind of like Thriller was for Michael Jackson coming from the Jackson That's Five. Right. It works. It works that way. Right. Is that kind of. This is very. Um, this is I was actually thinking this is his um, his rock with you. Yeah. It's where you're seeing the grown up John Lennon for the first time. This kind of like rock with you. It's like, oh, Michael's grown up. It's like, oh, shit. Mm hmm. I think I think imagine is that yeah. for the for, for, for the young teenage girl that started listening to him at sixteen, it's now twenty seven. And it's yeah. like 
you know, and it's about to get married and have mm-hmm. kids and stuff. You know what I'm saying? People, and, my, people my mother's age, yeah. yeah. Yes, and have grown up, listen, hearing stories about World War II and watching the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's obviously and, releasing this song in the at the height of the Vietnam War, too. too. Correct. Correct. So that's what I mean about it. Like, well, it connects a lot of dots because it's like he's very, um, I like the boy band comparison. I think people often forget that. I forget that often too because I'm more into their album work that happened when they stopped doing live yeah. shows. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I yeah. forget the whole boy band fandom. I just know the great album makers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They were great but pop songwriters. Too. <laughs> well, I mean, to be honest with you, it's like, most of most of their early stuff, it's songs about drugs and girls. It's like it's very boy band type stuff. It's, it's, like, it's almost all about girls to start with. Like originally, yeah, yeah. the early stuff is. Um, yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be. You're a young boy. Yeah. yeah, and and that and exactly that's not it's not inappropriate at that point. Like yeah. that's what you're interested in. <laughs> baby, you can drive my car, and baby, like yeah. <laughs> it's, there, there's some definitely metaphors there too, but like it's, but there are. It starts to get a little more complex in the mid '60s, but yeah, this is this is imagine is one of those statements of, and I'm an adult, and and there's a world happening like outside of my personal heart and personal soul, right? Right, and, and I think too, <clears throat> and, and and we keep going back to this. It's so simply put together and short and brief, but poignant. Mm-hmm. Not long. No. It's not complicated. It's easy you to know, play. You know, it's easy to sing. It's easy to play. The message is strong. What do we keep going back to? Man, there are stars and there are people with voices. It's like, well, when this record comes on, it's like, well, you know that voice, that guy's a star. That is part of it. Yep. This, this one of those records where it's like, well, no, part of the record is about the fact that this guy's a megastar. Yeah. Like somebody lesser couldn't make this record and it had this impact. Somebody lesser than John Lennon couldn't get away with making the first line of his song, Imagine There's No Heaven, in 1970. Like, you just couldn't do that. But he's speaking to how people are feeling about the war, though. Yeah, that's exactly. That, that's what I mean about, well, well, even though... Imagine there's no countries. It's, yeah, like, nothing to yeah. kill or die for. Like, we don't... You, oh. And he's speaking to up to the to the idea that all of this is made up, right? Like countries and possession, like all of that is not something. It's something we bought into, but we don't have to. There, like there, there is something this that kind of this is what I mean. This is one of those records that touches a lot of things too. Well, he's kind of holding himself to a higher court. It's almost biblical in that sense. Yeah, it is. It's like. Where he's saying, well, what if there was no country? It's like, well, you know, well, biblically speaking, there's only like one country. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? And no. so he's speaking He's speaking to a higher power in a sense, too. And he's not necessarily speaking to, he doesn't say there is no heaven. He says, he's saying, imagine there's like, right. in, in the, he's, what he's doing, it, I mean, it's not originally written only as a Vietnam War protest song, but like he's going down all of the things that people kill each other over right and that's one of the things that people are killing each other over he sounds like a white man looking beyond the purview of his privilege too Mm -hmm. yeah he is john lennon he He is one of the most privileged people on the planet at that point and he does not have to make this record no you know what i mean so this is coming and people probably can identify with that too it's like john lennon don't gotta make this record this right after the beatles broke up too you know what i mean yeah John Lennon didn't have to make another record the re- the rest of his life if he didn't want to, like uh, financially speaking. Anyway, like it's it's just, I mean, but musically speaking too. Yeah. If he would have stopped, I mean, you know, with Let It Not Let It Be, he, McCartney wrote that, but like he started with with the Let It Be album. I mean, if that's where he stopped, then you know what? <laughs> with... Right. So there is something about that. That's what I mean about like, well, the star matters in this song because there's something about that that probably struck a chord with the people too. That's what I'm saying is like, well, your favorite, your favorite guy from your favorite boy band is all grown up, but it turns out he's really fucking dope as an adult artist too. Yeah. And he actually has stayed connected with you this whole time. Mm-hmm. 
knows what's going on. Yeah, outside. people. Yeah, because the people that were his fans are are aging along with him too, and the people right. who were, I mean, they're five to ten years younger than him, but they're they're going through basically the same life stages as as him too i mean and his life was pretty not complicated but like his interpersonal relationship stuff was pretty complicated like he he got divorced and um his son julian um the, julian is the one that paul mccartney wrote hey jude for hey jude is for Ju john's son julian um and when john got with yoko he didn't exactly cast julian aside but he certainly paid a lot less attention to him and and that's an you know an ego and travel and all that other shit and like and i think he regretted that in his later life and i think they reconciled later in life but um he had a son with yoko named sean um sean lennon and that was and they're not whole albums of songs that he wrote about sean but like tons of things that he wrote in the mid-70s um about beautiful uh, a song called beautiful boy like i mean there's lots of so he doted on sean his son with yoko much more than he did with julian i mean some of that's just being older and some of it's i mean there's lots of things like that but there there's the sense also not just that he's getting older but he's still dealing and wrestling with complicated human emotions too that a lot of other people can love life children new relationships new marriages yeah balance quality and quality of life with family and and the idea that your new girl broke up your band too that's that's not necessarily true but like the legend always has gone that yoko ono broke up the beatles um and so kind of looks that and, way. And, and and paul and paul does say like in different documentaries and stuff like that that john was more interested in hanging out with yoko than with than writing songs with them so in a way it's true but like it's also a lot to put just on her it's honestly it would be more him than her but chicken um, of the egg you know yeah the the lyric though you may say that i'm a dreamer that's one of those most important lyrics ever done you may say that i'm a dreamer but i'm not the only one that's that's where you're talking about making it universal right you may say that i'm a dreamer but i'm not the only one so he's he's including all of us now um and i hope right. someday you'll join us in the world will live as one like that's a sentiment that transcends the time and space it's one of the other reasons the song is so important is because that's a sentiment that doesn't just work for the vietnam war that era um, it works for now. It worked. It would yeah, have worked for years before that, too. And um, it works to play at weddings. I played the song at um, somebody's wedding, actually, um, on my 21st birthday. Um, so it, it works in that context. It works in it, wor it works not everywhere, but it works in lots of different ways, much like Goodbye does, actually. Um, it, it is a song that contain despite despite how simply it's put together it's it contains a lot of different things and it crosses over lots of lines and it crosses over um, and connects lots of dots i agree i think that's actually very uh well said it's um it's one of those songs that one indoctrinated in the culture mm -hmm. it is everywhere for sure it's everywhere and, you know, everybody can relate to some piece of this record at some point in that matter, you know, because yeah. people want, <clears throat> you know, people want to belong to the tribe. Yep. And some they want to feel like they belong. This is one of those songs for, like, think about this <clears throat> from this perspective, and then I have to go. Right. The Beatles are broken up. You know what I mean? So they have a whole, they, they have the largest tribe in the history of music. Yeah. And the tribe doesn't know which way to go. Mm -hmm. This gave a lot of the followers somewhere to go. Yeah. It was letting them know it's like, well, that is over, but there's this. This is yeah. life. Yeah. And so there's that perspective of it too. That's what I mean. It's like, well, him being who he is matter. And this song traveling to where it did because, well, he kind of came with 
you know, the biggest following we've ever seen. That's right. Exactly. So, and, like, and I'm like, sure it, Michael, Michael Jackson hasn't happened yet. You know what I'm right. saying? But we've never seen anything even to compare what's going on with them too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and I'm sure it's not an accident that Talib Kweli two the biggest citations in his song are both songs that came out after the Beatles broke up too. That's some real life stuff too. Live and Let Die and Imagine are both post Beatles songs. Right. So which he probably might be more familiar with for his age demographic. Might be. Yeah. Right. 